I hate when someone intros me real good. Because then I'm like, wow, that's a high bar. So if I, if I suck, it just, it's, it's her fault. It's, she just set your expectations too high. <laughs> I am um, elated to be here this evening. It really, it's a true honor and pleasure. I'm coming from Oakland, California. Uh, and so I got up at 5.15 this morning uh, and slathered on some lotion, uh, <laughs> put myself on a plane. And I'm so, I'm just so, so glad to be here. Uh, this conference sounds phenomenal. Um, and my work is so much about the body and about how we learn to live in our bodies through this concept that uh, we call radical self-love um, and how we use radical self-love as a foundation for radical human love in service toward a more just, equitable, and compassionate world. That's really what it is that we are, our goal is. I want you to love yourselves, but for really specific agenda, um, so that that love might further um, a planet where we all can live unapologetically in our bodies. And so this workshop is sort of going to take you through a bit of a journey um, as they asked me to open it with the poem. Uh, with a poem. In this particular, po the poem s came before everything else. The poem started all of this other stuff. The poem asked, refused to be silent. It asked to do more work. It was like, thanks, that was nice, that's a poem. And what's next? And what's next? And what's next? Um, and so there was really this sort of movement happening underneath the poem um, that sort of came to fruition, and we'll talk about that in the workshop a little bit. Um, but this is the poem that started all of it, uh, which I, of course, had no idea when I wrote it. Um, I really just wanted to write a love letter to your bodies. And so this poem is called The Body is Not an Apology. The body is not an apology. Let it not be forget-me-not fixed to mattress when night threatens to leave the room empty as the belly of a crow. The body is not an apology. Do not present it as a disassembled rifle when they have yet to prove themselves more than common intruder. The body is not an apology. Let it not be common as oil, ash, or toilet. Let it not be small as gravel, stain, or teeth. Let it not be mountain when it is sand. Let it not be ocean when it is grass. Let it not be shaken, flattened, or raised in contrition. The body is not an apology. Do not present the body as communion, confession. Do not ask for it to be pardoned as criminal. The body is not a crime, is not a gun, is not a spill to be contained, not a lost set of keys, a wrong number dialed. It is not the orange burst of blood to shame white dresses. The body is not an apology. It is not the unintended granule of bone beneath will. The body is not kill, is not unkempt car, is not a forgotten appointment. Do not speak it vulgar. The body is not soiled, not filth to be forgiven. The body is not an apology. It is not a father's backhand. It's not mother's dinner late again, wrecked jaw howl. It is not the drunken sorcery of contorting steel, round tree. The body is not calamity. The body is not a math test. The body is not a wrong answer. The body is not a failed class. You are not failing. The body is not a cavity, not a hole to be filled, to be yanked out, not a broken thing to be mended, be tossed. The body is not prison, is not sentence to be served, is not pavement, is not prayer. Do not give the body as gift, only receive it as such. The body is not to be prayed for, is to be prayed to. So, for the evermore tortile 10th grade knows, hallelujah. For the shower song throat that crackles like a grandfather's Victrola, hallelujah. For the spine that never healed, for the lambent heart that didn't either, hallelujah. For the sloping pulp of back, hip, belly, hosanna. For the wild hairs that rove the face like a pack of misplaced wolves, hosanna. For the parts we have endeavored to excise, blessed be the cancer, the palsy, the womb that opens like a trap door. Praise the body in its blackjack magic, even in this for the razor wire mouth, 
for the sweet God ribbon within. Praise for the mistake that never was. Praise for the mistake you never were. Praise for the bend, twist, fall, and rise again. Fall and rise again. For the raising like an obstinate Christ. For the salvation of a body that bends like a baptismal bowl. For those who will worship at the lip of this sanctuary. Praise the body, for the body is not an apology. The body is deity. The body is God. The body is God, the only righteous love who will never need repent. Thank you. <laughs> so I wrote that poem for a friend of mine. Um, I'm, I'm known for getting in people's business. And so I was getting in the business of a friend of mine um, who has cerebral palsy and was fearful that she might have be pregnant with an unexpected pregnancy. Um, and you know, I'm prone to getting in people's business, so I was all up in her business asking her um, what had made her decide to have unprotected sex with this person who I knew wasn't her partner and those sorts of things. And her response to me was that um, because it was already difficult because of her disability to be sexual, she didn't feel entitled to ask this person to use a condom. And my response to her in statement was, your body is not an apology. It is not something you offer to someone to say, I'm sorry, I'm disabled. Um, and the words wouldn't leave me. That, wor that your body is not an apology would not leave me. Uh, and so shortly after that conversation, I started writing the poem. And I wrote the poem, and I wrote the poem, and I wrote the poem, and, uh, and then I started performing the poem for about a year. And like I said, it just, for some reason, it just would not leave me. And um, like I said, it was demanding to do something more. Uh, and so I'll tell you a little bit more about how it went from being a poem to being a movement to being the company I now run. So uh, we're, I'm going to tell you that, so I'm not going to just talk at you, but I'm going to tell you that. And then I'm also going to tell you ways that you can start living unapologetically in your body today right now because it's a hard task right we don't live in a society that makes it really easy for us to live unapologetically in our bodies right pretty much nobody gets off <laughs> and some folks you know there are levels to it but nobody gets off right and so there are things that we can begin to do today that can shift the dynamic of self-loathing and being a combatant in your own being to being an ally in your body and to actually being able to step into this journey of radical self-love. And so this workshop is going to be, it's going to tell you a little bit of everything, but it's going to tell you some of that. And it's also going to tell you uh, a little bit about how we came about and all that good stuff. Does that sound like a plan? You all are so quiet and beautiful and divine in that divinity school kind of way. <laughs> um, so I am also, if you haven't noticed, a pretty animated, talkative person. This is totally a space where you're allowed to talk back at me. You're allowed to interrupt me and ask a question. You're allowed to say, mm-hmm, say it, Sonia. All of those things work for me. They all work for me. Uh, cool? Are we good with that? Yeah. Awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So, uh, and can, have I told everybody how much I love these? It's the little clicky thing for the PowerPoint. There is nothing better than whoever invented the little clicky thing for the PowerPoint. It is like having a Harry Potter wand. It's the best. <laughs> There's nothing better. So anyway, this is the top 10 tools to radical self-love, a transformational journey uh, to jumpstart your journey, a transformational workshop to jumpstart your journey into radical self-love. My name is Sonia Renee Taylor. I'm a performance poet, I'm an activist, and I am the radical executive officer of The Body Is Not An Apology. What's awesome when you start a company is you get to decide what you want to call yourself. And I was like, CEO is boring. <laughs> oh, I'm going to be the REO, which then reminds me of the 80s band, REO Speedwagon. It all comes together. It's awesome. It's fantastic. Uh, so during our time together, we're going to talk about what's this radical self-love stuff. When did we start to hate them? Hate them being what? ourselves, these bodies we live in, this vessel, this, these beings that we walk this planet with, that we're stuck with forever. Isn't it trippy to hate something you got to be with from the time you wake up until the time you go to bed for the rest of your life? What a, what a sentence to serve, right? So what if we weren't serving a sentence in our bodies? 
Right? Um, whose agenda is my self-hate? Whose agenda is my self-hate? The act of birthing a new body, some bonus brilliance that I like to throw in there, um, a fond ado, and then I open the floor for a greater discussion and all that good stuff. Cool? Word? Boom. What is this radical self-love stuff? And so for us, there are some specific things around it. Um, and very specifically, when I talk about radical self-love, that is the concept that fuels um, the work that the body is not an apology does. It is all about sort of how we frame our mission, our vision, our goals, all of those things. And so we were, were a global movement focused on radical self-love. We started February 9th of 2011. And I'm going to tell you how we got there. So I told you I had this poem, right? This poem that wouldn't shut up. It talked to me all the time. It was telling me to do something. But I didn't know what it was telling me to do. And then I just happened to have this situation where I was sitting at a friend's couch in California before I lived there. Um, and I had been holding on to a selfie in my phone. Now, this, I was giving it to the people in the selfie, as I like to say. I was giving it to the people. Uh, I was in this little saucy black corset, and I was getting ready for a performance, and I had snapped a picture of myself. Um, and I felt divine, yeah. right? <laughs> I felt divine in it. But I was having a, a conflict between what I call the inside voice and the outside voice, right? Now, historically, we know inside voice and outside voice is usually like you're, you're talking too loud in a space, right? But I, which I think is actually still accurate, because what happens is the outside voice is talking too loud in your space, right? And it, sometimes it's talking so loud that you think it's your own voice. You think it is you believing these things about yourself. What I'm going to offer you is that it's not. That it, it, it is the indoctrination of years and years and years of body shame and what we call body terrorism, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as well, living inside of us. So it, when we organically feel in our power, in our natural state of beauty and wonder and awesomeness, the outside voice starts talking to us, right? Oh, girl, don't post that picture. You're too fat, too black, too this, that, whatever. Not enough, this, that, whatever, right? It's usually always in one of those, one of those spheres, right? Not enough or the too much. Um, but that voice, that voice was telling me, don't post this picture. You know, like, you sh you'll be ashamed. People will talk about you. Um, and so I didn't for three months. The photo sat for three months. Uh, and then I decided that I just didn't want it to sit. Something was calling me. Part of it was that someone had just posted a photo of a plus-size model on my wall. Her name is Tara Lynn. And she is fly, just fly, 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 fly. And she was in this big wicker chair, and she was naked, just crossed, legs crossed, just like that. And I was like, all right, I see you. Uh, <laughs> and so then I sort of went down a rabbit hole and started Googling Tara Lynn. And I realized that she had just been signed um, to a major modeling contract um, with uh, a lingerie company. And so one of the first images that pops up is Tara Lynn in a black corset, right? Just, and I was like, somebody pay her a lot of money <laughs> to be posing unapologetically on all the internets uh, in her black corset, right? In her black corset, and I'm sitting here tripping with my little selfie in my phone, right? Like, I, I need to get over myself. And, uh, and fix that. And so I decided I was going to post a photo. And in the photo, I posted the photo on Facebook, and I said, in this photo, I am 230 pounds. I have a really terrible decision of a tattoo on my left, uh, left thigh that I made when I was 23. Don't do it, y'all. You'll regret it later. Uh, <laughs> um, but I feel powerful and beautiful in my body. Somebody, please post a picture where you feel powerful and beautiful in your body, and let's take a day to celebrate ourselves. That's what I said. Uh, and I posted the photo, and then the next morning, I woke up, and like 25, 30 folks all had posted images where they felt beautiful and powerful in their bodies. And it was just this gorgeous moment of, of affirmation, where what it was is that somebody was waiting for me to step out into my power, so that they could have permission to step out into their power. And that's so often what the world is just like, hey, somebody needs you to hold the, you know, to open the door for them. You know, so, with the, so you, gotta, you, you gotta step first. And so I did that. And I was like, wow, that's awesome. It really seems like, at least my Facebook friends, 
would like a community where we can feel good about ourselves and just sort of like say nice things to each other and like give affirmations. I'm going to start a Facebook page. So I was like, finally, I, well, I already have a name for it. I got this poem called The Body's Not Apology. I'm going to start a little Facebook page. It's going to be called The Body's Not Apology. That was four years ago. Um, over 50,000 people in over 45 countries. Our content reaches anywhere from 100,000 to 150,000 people weekly. Um, we've been highlighted on the Today Show and MSNBC.com and all sorts of things. And it's all because like, I decided that I wasn't going to listen to the outside voice and that I was going to go on ahead and unapologetically claim that I'm beautiful. And it's OK for me to claim that I'm beautiful. Uh, and all of that came from that. So you can applaud that, because I just think that's important. <laughs> not for me, right? Like, and not important for me, but important for you to know that whatever it is that's nagging you, telling you to do it, that you're not listening to because you're scared, because you don't believe you're good enough, because blah, 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 blah. Whatever that is, stop listening to that. Because you have no idea. You have no idea what the universe is conspiring for on your behalf as soon as you get out of your fear, right? That's why I say that. So we went from a little Facebook page to um, last year we launched a crowdfunding campaign um, because we had been using pretty much social media SERP, uh, websites to do most of our work. We, you know, I had writers, but all of our stuff was getting posted to Tumblr. And then we had articles, but they were just getting posted on Facebook. And then Facebook decided that they wanted you to pay them, so they would diminish how many people got to see your stuff. And I was like, mm, what if we just have our own home, right? Like, what if we just have our own space where we can do this work collectively in community? Uh, and then I found out that wasn't free, so <laughs> I had to raise some money. Um, and it was the scariest thing I've ever done in my life. Um, I asked my community um, to help me raise $80,000 to build the world's number one online resource for radical self-love content. And um, we raised $43,000, uh, and we built thebodiesnotanapology.com, which is a digital magazine, a social networking site that runs just like Facebook. Like basically, we just kind of took Facebook stuff and put it on our own thing. <laughs> without all the misogyny and patriarchy and racism and sexism that Facebook has. Uh, <laughs> um, social media uh, forum, we have an online forum where people from all over the world have deeper discussions. Like, we had an amazing thread the other day about people talking about navigating psychotropic drugs after mental health diagnosis. And we had someone in Austria talking to someone in Kansas about uh, their shared diagnosis and not feeling as alone in the world as a result of that. That's the type of stuff that gets facilitated in that space. Um, and then we do online webinars and workshops all from the website. And so we built it, and it's awesome. And so I'm going to ask all of you when you leave here tonight, actually, you can just pick up your little phone right now and just put it in there, uh, thebodiesnotapology.com. It's all right, all right, I see you. <laughs> Um, but it's an amazing resource that does exactly what it is that we hoped it would do. We've got 20 writers in four different countries. We have writers in Morocco, in Kuwait, in Spain, in England. Um, we, have, uh, con we just have an amazing crew of human beings all committed to this concept of radical self-love. Uh, and so that's, that's what happened. These are the countries and people, Netherlands, Brazil, Italy, Argentina, Colombia, India. All over the world, people engage with our content. The body is not our public. We have some really core beliefs that, like I said, that serve as the foundation of the work that we do. We believe that discrimination, social inequality, and, in, and injustice are largely at their roots manifestations of our inability to make peace with the body, our own and other people's bodies. And so through information dissemination, uh, personal and social transformation projects, what we now call radical education, and community building. The body is not an apology, fosters radical, unapologetic self-love, which we believe translates into radical human love and action. I want you to hear those two things together. Radical human love and action. Love that does not do work isn't love. Love that does not do work isn't love. 
All right? If you, who, I mean, who, who dated somebody who's like, I love you, I ain't never done nothing that looked like love, right? <laughs> Y'all better tell the truth, and I hope you left them. I hope you left them. I hope they are gone. Um, right? But that's the thing, right? People will, say, people will pay lip service to love, but tr- actual love, actual love looks like work. Right? Cornel West says, uh, um, justice is what love looks like in public. Right? And justice requires work. Right? So, we believe that rad- we foster global, radical, unapologetic self love, which translates to radical human love and work in action t- toward a more just, equitable, and compassionate world. That as we shift our relationship with ourselves, we shift our relationship with the rest of the planet. There are so many activists in the world who, you know, who are you know, really diligently focused on tearing down oppressive structures and systems, um, but haven't tore down the oppressive structures and systems inside themselves. Right? And so what ends up happening is you tear it down, and then you build the same thing that was there before. Right? If we don't do this work first, It actually doesn't matter what we do out there. We will recreate the system unless we dismantle it inside ourselves first. So with that as the foundation of our work and what we do, we want to talk about this idea of when did we learn to hate them, them being these vessels that we travel the planet in. So my question is always, when did we go from this who remembers it? Like, I mean, this is pretty early memory. You'd have to be going back if you could remember this. But oftentimes we do have memories of still, like, being fascinated by our bodies. Does anybody still, anybody have any memory of that? Like, when you were like, oh, that's, look at, that's an elbow. Or when you learned you can make your armpit fart, right? Or, like, just weird, wild, kooky things that your body did that you thought were fantastic, that you thought were neat, Right? And we, and we marveled at them. This, this child is not con- concerned about their squishy belly from a perspective of judgment or wrongness. Just fascination. Just like, l- wow, I can turn it. It's like Play-Doh. That's awesome. You know, like, what if, what if we went home tonight? Like, wow, that's like Play-Doh. That's awesome. Right? Instead of lamenting. Instead of lamenting that, Right? Or this, I love these babies. Like, who's like, look at my feet! Right, that's like, look at these feet! (laughs) And her her brother's like, I just really don't know what to tell you about my sister and her feet, but she's into that, right? But there is an unfettered joy. It is so obvious and clear that what they feel is absolutely nothing that resembles shame, right? There is nothing that resembles shame in these children's bodies, right? That is how we all got here. That's every single one of us. Every single one of us got here like that. We came here as radical self-love. But then we end up to this, right? We end up to racism and sexism and transphobia and homophobia and ageism and stigma and ableism. We end up at skin lighteners and cutting away at ourselves. We end up at organizations that are supposed to be about, like, you know, ethical treatment of animals using bodies, body shame to promote their messages, right? That's what we've gone to, right? And so we want to talk a little bit about how we got to that. I want, this is the point where I want you all to spend a little time convening with yourselves. I want you to think about your first memory of body shame. The first time when you remember feeling like you were not good enough. I'm going to ask everybody to close your eyes for a second. (laughs) Yeah. Not a, <laughs> fair, enough, fair enough, everybody is at will, everyone is at will, you certainly don't have to go if you want to. What I can assure you, though, is that I, don't, I don't ever leave people in sadness. I don't believe in that. I may take us to through, but I'm promising you a way out. I always promise that. So, 
If you are willing, take a moment and close your eyes. And I want you to think about that memory. I want you to get it. It's the one that still stings. It's the one you try not to visit too often. I want you to think about where you were. What happened? What happened? How old were you? How did it make you feel? And when you have that memory, I want you to give me a church finger. I love them someplace where everybody knows what that is. <laughs> give me a little church finger when you have the memory. All right. All right. Okay. Everybody can open your eyes. Come back. Thank you. Thank you for allowing yourselves to go there. I know it's hard. It's hard. It wasn't, it wasn't fun then. It ain't fun now. Right? Is there anyone feeling fear-facing enough? I use the term fear-facing rather than, I don't believe in fearlessness. I don't think, I think fear is an important, natural, healthy response in our bodies. And sometimes fear is not serving us. And so the option is to turn toward fear, face it, and step anyway. So that's why I say fear-facing. Is anyone fear, feeling fear-facing enough to share their memory? Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing that. Four. Four. Anyone else? Thank you. So when you were 11, you got that message that I'm different, and that's not okay, right? Like, it's not okay for me to not have hair like the other people in school, so it's better to just not have it at all. Yeah. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Anybody else want to share? Yeah. <laughs> Still feel some kind of way. <laughs> And so we get these early messages about, like, what our bodies are supposed to look like, right, in which category they're supposed to fit into. And if they don't, something's wrong with us, right? Anybody else want to share a story? Yeah.
Thank you. So that moment where something is happening to our body and we don't know what it is, and then we're shamed for not knowing what it is and for, for it not matching what it is that we know of ourselves, right? So all of these things come and they inform us at really early ages. How many people's story happened between 13 and 15? Your memory is 13 and 15. Anybody over 15? Yeah. Whose was between 10 and 12? Whose was between um, 8 or, yeah, is it 8 and 10? Yeah. Who was under 8? Wow. Right. See how early that seed gets planted? Basically, right after you get done playing with your belly and thinking it's awesome, right? Then somebody comes, hey, nope, right? and steals that little piece of joy we had. So much of body shame often develops in our, youth, in our youth. It can often be a response to rapid body shifting, right? Like, oh, all of a sudden I have a period, or all of a sudden I have stretch marks, or all of a sudden I have hair in the place where I didn't, or whatever it is, that body change that we weren't expecting. Um, it's often when we become aware of a difference. Oh, I don't have hair like the rest of the girls in my class, you know. Oh, I feel this way on the inside, but someone's telling me that I'm this, that I have to be this, right? Um, it's often connected to some should, right? I should look like this, or I should have this. I should have girl legs, right? Whatever girl legs are, right? Um, often reinforce by social and cultural and familial and political messaging, right? So, right, you didn't get the uh, nicest booty, right? <laughs> right, which oftentimes, at least when I was growing up, it was a very cultural thing, right? Like, in black communities, you wanted to have the nicest booty. When I was in white communities, nobody was caring about my booty. <laughs> it was an interesting thing. Um, and oftentimes, those body shames are attached to a story, right? To some story that continues often to live long after that moment has passed. Long after that moment has passed. So I want to share my story of body shame, my sort of origin. There are lots. Many of us w can remember multiple instances, like the one I asked you all to recall. Um, but there are some that sting a little bit more than others. So this one is my story of my body shame. Um, and it was about my hair. Um, and I'm going to share this video with you all. Uh, excerpt. Make my 
my life sad. <laughs> and she always started the school bus ride with a chant. It was very quiet at first. Sonia, Sonia. and wept closest to the bus driver. This felt like it lasted the entirety of the bus ride. This felt like it lasted the entirety of my school life, although I'm sure it didn't. But, you know, there was just something about their words. Tanya and Bus 35 permanently implanted themselves on my brain. They became the soundtrack of my most visceral insecurity. Music of my adolescence. My first date, Sonia, Sonia Bosfides. The first time I kissed a boy, Sonia, Sonia Bosfides. The first time I fell in love, Sonia, Sonia Bosfides. They would be singing just behind my back. Some nights I went to bed certain that I would wake up and they'd be hovered above my head, singing my misery. So, that is me and Sonia Ballspots. And it's really interesting. I did that show in hmm, 2010. And it's the first time I ever publicly said the story. It was the f maybe six months before it was the first time I could say the words Sonia Bald Spots and not like get the thing in my throat, like it was gonna close up, right? It was still living with me. It was third grade, and this was 2010, so at this point I was 34, and I was still Sonia Bald Spots inside of myself. How many people have body shame memories that are still living with you. You're still in them, still connected to them. They govern some portion of your life, all right? Ooh, no, girl, I wore skirts in 73, right? Because <laughs> somebody said dot, 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 right? They live with, they stick, right? They stick with us. And so oftentimes, 20, 30, 40 years later, we are still in our story. We're still believing that whatever it was, that message we got is true. And consequently, we're not enough or we're too dot, 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 right? So I want to talk about this idea of whose agenda is your self-hate, right? Because we've gotten this thing, right? And oftentimes we, we think that our agenda, right, like that it was my, my self-hate was Sonia Twyman's fault, right? The truth of the matter is Sonia Twyman was just giving me what somebody gave her, right? That each and every time we're experiencing that outside voice, it is from someone else who is indoctrinated with the same crappy messaging. Somebody else who was told that they were not good enough. Somebody else who's at home dealing with their story that they've been in for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Right? Isn't it a really interesting um, article? A former, I think her name is... Uh, it's not going to come to me right now. But she was a writer for Jezebel, and she had a person who, you know, she, she's a fat activist, and so she gets trolled incessantly. People just, you know, wake up to say hateful things to her. Um, and she had this one particular troll who went to Twitter, created a fake account in her dead father's name so that he could just tell her horrible things every single day. And so... Oftentimes, you know, people's responses don't feed the trolls, right? Like, just don't ignore them. But really what that means is, like, silence, right? Like, you be silent, and they continue to get to harass you. Um, and she decided that that wasn't what she was going to do, that she was going to just actually be a human and be vulnerable and speak her truth about it. And so she wrote about, she wrote back to this person and told, told him, like, the real life impact of what he was doing on her. Um, and, and he wrote her back in like rare, 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 rare reality. He wrote her back and he apologized and he was like, the truth is I just 
hate myself. And every time I read you not hating yourself, I can't understand it. And so I just fuck with you because I don't know what else to do about how much I hate myself. And that is usually what is happening, is that we are perpetuating self-hatred and um, loathing out into the world because it is bubbling up inside of us in a way in which we can no longer contain. And so then we're just our worst selves in the world. Um, and so when I say whose agenda is your self-hate, I'm not talking about on the individual level, because individuals often are just living out the cycles that they've been taught. It's deeper than that. This is a chart of total media ad spending from 2011 and 2017. These numbers are in the billions. So, and every year you notice they increase. In 2011, we sp advertisers spent $158.3 billion on ads. In 2014, they spent $177.8 billion on ads. And then pretty much it's expected to go up, you know, to go up between 5 million and 10 million every single year, on and on and on. People spend a lot of money trying to sell you stuff. A lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of money. This is a statistic from a fantastic documentary called Misrepresentation. I don't know, folks may have seen it. Um, it's a documentary about the impact of media on young girls. And US women spend $12,000 to $15,000 a year on beauty products and salon services. What would you do with $15,000? Right now, somebody just gave you fifteen thousand dollars right now. What would you do with it? <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love it. I do shop. <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, maybe some school. Right. <laughs> Who else? What would you do with fifteen thousand dollars if you had fifteen grand? Well, I, have, I probably would um, put ten thousand to my college debt. Okay. Mom. Okay. All right. We done. We done paid off some school debt. Hooked mama up. What else? Probably like building my family and like go and Okay. See some family. Go visit. Pay some school loans. Ah, oh, that's right. You trying to figure out how to flip the fifteen thousand? <laughs> Flipping 15, flipping 15, okay. Anybody else? What would you do if somebody just gave, walked in and gave you $15,000 right now? Oh, we're going to eat. Oh, about to eat for real with 15 grand. I mean, I eat, but <laughs> I was like, but 15 grand, you're about to eat, eat. <laughs> what were you saying? Medical bills, right? Travel, extensive travel. Go see some stuff, right? All the stuff, all the things, going to see all the things. These are some phenomenal, amazing things we would do with $15,000 that we spend on lipstick and conditioners and um, pedicures and weave. <laughs> right? Like, that's, that's where that goes, right? $15,000 we spend trying to figure out how to be good enough in the world. That's really what that is at the surface, right? And don't get me wrong. I always say to people this, like, I am pro be fly. I'm into that, if you, ha if you haven't noticed. Um, <laughs> I'm into feeling good and looking good and all of those things. The question is always not what you do, but why are you doing it, right? Almost always, for me, it is not about the action. It's about the the motivation underneath the action. Like, am I buying that to fill some empty hole that is where my radical self-love should live? Am I buying that to go back and retrieve ball-headed Sonya, you know, and, and figure out how to stop living with them chanting in my ear 30 years later? Those are the questions to ask ourselves when we spend the money. And oftentimes, if we're asking ourselves that, once we dwindle it down, we might actually be saving some of that. That doesn't mean all 15 of it will go, but maybe six of it would, maybe 3,000 of it would, and what would you do with an extra three grand sitting around, right? 
Oh, I did a thing. Come back. Ta-da. Fact. I love these things. Beauty spending on makeup, diet, and exercise, fragrances, skin care, hair products, and cosmetic surgery adds up to $160 billion per year worldwide. And so when that other slide I showed you, there was $170 billion on ads. That's on all the ads. That's to sell your cars or whatever, whatever, whatever. And what they get back is, so they just spent a fraction of that on beauty, right, things. Because we come back and we quadruple the number that they spent on advertising with our purchases. $160 billion a year. And I'm sure this was, two, this is 2003. So that's an old, old slide. Imagine how much money we're spending right now on those things, right? $160 billion is more than the gross domestic product of Costa Rica, Uzbekistan, and Tanzania combined. That we are spending on perfume more than the entire economic framework of three countries combined. <laughs> that's wild, right? <laughs> like, damn, that's a lot of money, right? $160 billion is more than the gross domestic product of 130 global nations. That we spend more on fixing ourselves than almost all the world has in money, period. Than countries spend for their entire infrastructure. We're spending that to, I was spending that to, you know, figure out how to get Sonia Bald Spots to stop playing in my ear. Right? I like when that pops out like that and changes colors. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, no, 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 no. I always do that. I keep forgetting to delete this duplicate side. There we go. Another um, statistic from misrepresentation. 34 women have ever served as governor. How many, how many governors has there been since we started having governors? Anybody want to take a guess? Somebody take a guess. Just a number. Just, just guess. 10,000. Okay. Another guess. <laughs> Don't whisper it. <laughs> You're doing the math. <laughs> there are 50 states. Been 50 <laughs> the union has been in its age, right? <laughs> give me somebody. Give me one more guess. One more guess. Right. Okay, so we got 10,000 on this end, we got 200 on that end. <laughs> we have a spread here. <laughs> there have been 2,319 men. Yeah, yeah, you split the difference, split the difference. <laughs> 2,319 men, right? You cannot tell me that there's not a correlation between this number and the, the $160 billion that women are spending on beauty and makeup and fragrances and blah, 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 blah. You can't tell me that I'm over here being told that I need to focus on this while somebody else is running the world, making all the decisions about my life, right? I love this quote. A culture fixated on female thinness is not an obsession about female beauty but an obsession about female obedience. Dieting is the most potent political sedative in women's history. A quietly mad population is a tractable one. If I can spend all of my focus figuring out how to not be deficient as a person, how to not be um, not beautiful enough, not good enough, not thin enough, not whatever. If I, if I can be here, right, then decisions can be made that continue to rob power and autonomy from me can be made over here without me ever questioning them. I didn't even notice that you had signed away my reproductive rights because I was putting on lipstick, right? I didn't even see you when you, you know, gutted my health care. You know, I didn't even notice that because I was over here trying to figure out how to lose that last five pounds at Weight Watchers. All right. Yeah. Um, and that was, well, that was one of my first memories that I had of sitting, um, having a skinny best friend when we were living in Ohio. Mm. Um, and seeing basically a person in the sense of um, how young boys are attracted to fat. And I was always a pony, but I used to 
Mm. in the world right right absolutely it's so whether or not I may know what's happening but do I do I feel powerful enough to speak up do I believe that I'm worthy enough to have a voice in the conversation you know like all, it's happening on the, again multiple levels right so it, we may not just be blinded to it but now we've our self-esteem has been eroded in such a way that we don't feel capable to come to the conversation right and I just offer to you that none of that is by accident Right? It wasn't like, oops, we just, you know, sorry, that just sort of happened. That's not how that happens. It didn't just sort of happen. It was very intentional. Right? New and emerging markets, right? So one of the things that I think is happening in the world, right? So if we're dealing with the American construct of this at least, but I think even if you see it around the world, right? Like what you're looking at in terms of the ideal body is able-bodied, cis, white, heterosexual, young. Those are your five pieces, right? Like, that's it. That's the, the pinnacle. However, right, and then there were all these other people sort of below, and we could tell them they weren't good enough, and they'd just be over someplace lamenting about not being good enough and spending money and killing themselves and doing whatever else it is, right, while people would hoard power. Well, then some folks, then, what happened was the world just sort of started waking up, like, you know, when we're like, wait a minute, why, why can't I vote, right? <laughs> right? Black people were like, wait a minute, why am I slave, right? Like, people started questioning <laughs> some, just, right, some just real questions about the paradigm under which they were living. And so, consequently, they started challenging, we started challenging the power structure, which then makes the power structure clamp down. They have to clamp down on the tightness. So actually, I just have to figure out new and more interesting ways to make you hate yourself and be distracted, right? So new and interesting ways to make you hate yourself and be distracted. Men who don't have a six-pack, well, we'll sell you one in a tank top. <laughs> like, that's outlandish, right? But somebody right now is buying a slim and fit tank top so that they look like they got, you know, uh, who got good abs? Who got, <laughs> I was like, who's, who am I thinking of who's got those abs? You know, Shamar Moore, Shamar Moore abs. Sh oh, I thought it was like, oh, Shamar Moore. Tyrese, Tyson, right? It's lots of people. Anyway, right, you, you know, right, like right now we just told everybody that you need to have some Shamar Moore abs, mister. So go on ahead and buy your slim and lift, right? Uh, this is a magazine editorial spread from King Magazine. Uh, any specific things we notice about this ad? Oh, that's always my first one. Why is the black girl in the back? The darkest girl way off in the abyss, right? Right. Everybody's looking golden and tanned, right? What else? Yeah. Why are they just in their panties, right? They just... Why, why, why is everybody's hair straight? Not just straight, like fair of faucet blowing in the wind hair, right? Like, like certainly, more than likely, not the hair growing out their heads, naturally, right? Everybody's got a lace front. <laughs> right. <laughs> there, there is an ideal, right? There is a you should be this. You're not good enough as you are. You should be this, right? And we're going to put it in magazines, and we're going to tell you you should be this, and we're going to really indoctrinate you with it So, because we need you to not be paying attention. We need you to not be paying attention so that things don't have to change, so that the status quo stays the status quo, so that those who have the most power, access, resource, wealth, continue to have that, and that and that that is not challenged by anybody else, right? And then we see the impacts of these things, what happens, what the outcomes look like um, with these attacks on our bodies. 
men, the suicide rate for middle-aged men was 27.3 deaths per 100,000, while for women it was 8.1 deaths per 100,000. The most pronounced increases were seen among men in their 50s, a group in which suicide rates jumped by nearly 50%. Why are men in their 50s killing themselves? Guesses. Hmm? The economy. Jobs. Hmm? Child support. <laughs> Woo, that's a heavy child support bill. If <laughs> I cannot with you. I cannot. <laughs> Child support. Uh, <laughs> but so very similar, I think, uh, certainly this idea of economy, right? What, what is, what is um, uh, male value tied to? Not even so much. I mean, I see, I mean, Chris Christie is the, is the governor, right? He's powerful. And there's nothing it's standardly in his aesthetic, right, that is what we promote necessarily as, a pro, you know, like the aesthetic that you're looking for, right? He's a fat, short, white guy, right? Okay. Got you. So this idea of taking care of, and then what happens when you're not able to take care of anymore? And we measure taking care of by money. They, our society measures that by wealth. How much money do you make, right? How how much how much are you making? How much can you contribute? Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Right? That there. Right. I mean, that we, we really assign masculinity with the role of um, economic terror caker, right? And also of this idea of youth, right? Like, am I both able-bodied, right? Am I able-bodied and am I economically resourced enough to do whatever it is my responsibilities are? So when someone is aging, right, they've aged out of oftentimes able-bodiedness. Um, they've aged out of... Uh, economic resource, because younger folks have come and taken the jobs or whatever the case may be, then where's your self-worth come from? If your self-worth is tied in completely external things, when they are gone, what sustains you? What makes you decide to stay on the planet? Right? Um, the impact on body shaming on other bodies. Youth of color, young men age 15 to 19, um, we find that young black men in this age group are 21 times more likely to be killed by the police, right? We're looking at the impacts of body shame and body terrorism in our communities right now, in this current present day, right? If we weren't looking at those, Eric Garner would be alive, right? John Wilson would be alive, uh, Mike Brown would be alive, Trayvon Martin would be alive, Darius Simmons would be alive. I could keep saying names, right? We're seeing the impact of that. We're looking at the impact on transgender lives, 
The, trans the Transgender Day of Remembers 213 update revealed that a total of 238 cases of reported killings of trans people happened in the last 12 months, and in total, the preliminary results show that uh, 1,374 reports of murder of trans folks in 60 countries since January of 2008. The idea that your body must appear in a way that this structure says makes sense to them or that you don't deserve to be here. All right? Those are the impacts we're seeing. Yeah. Well, that's always, it's both, and that's always a difficult thing to figure out, right? Right. <laughs> right? So, so those, those statistics are convoluted. We're not totally sure, you know. Yeah. So you often don't even know that a trans person was killed, right? Mm -hmm. And if you don't have a DPS, you can use that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and we're in the second week in February of 2015, right? We're looking at the impact of lives on people with disabilities. These studies show that the rate of abuse among children with disabilities are variable, ranging from a low of 22% to a high of 70%. And all this stu although the studies found a round range of abuse prevalence, when taken as a whole, they provide consistent evidence that there's a link between children with disabilities and abuse, right? That there is a target on bodies. There's a target on bodies, unless those bodies show up in a way that we decide is okay, that the structure decides is acceptable. We call these impacts, the Bodies Not Apology calls these impacts body terrorism. And we very intentionally use this language. And I was once asked the question, don't you think that's hyperbolic? You know, with all the ter real terrorism, that's the word that was, all the real terrorism happening in the world, don't you think that's hyperbolic? And so I'm just going to read you my response to that person. From violence against people of color, i.e. lynching, slavery, internment camps, to LGBTQ bodies being assaulted, murdered, and driven to suicide regularly, to rape and sexual assault, to bombing of abortion clinics and murder of physicians based on women's right to autonomy over their own bodies, to the debilitating shame that people around the world live with as a result of psychological attacks, our social and media machines level against bodies that are fat, disindifferently abled, etc., ending in bulimia, anorexia, binge eating, stigma, mass self-hatred, and senseless violence as a result of body hatred. It is clear to us that there is nothing rhetorical or hyperbolic about being clear about the impacts of body hatred and calling the promotion of such hatred on any scale an act of terrorizing people based on their bodies. Mm. There is a reason that people don't want us to call it terrorism. Because what if we treated these things like we treat what we call terrorism? What if we put the resources that we put into, you know, ISIS, into ending body terrorism in our own country? Right, right? But that's, that's the reason why people don't want you to call it terrorism. Because then they start asking you where the resources to fight terrorism. Because I'm asking every day, where are the resources to fight terrorism? Here, right, and it's not, right, it's not some other thing, that it is us right now, the ways, every time I turn my television on and Biggest Loser comes on television, I'm watching terrorism. And we, we make whole television shows about it, right? We, and we've turned terrorism into entertainment. And then question when someone calls it what it is, right? And so I think it's essential that if we're going to be a movement this, that dismantles it, we have to name it as such. We have to name it as such. There is a political, economic benefit to the larger social system, the status quo, for people who have historically been oppressed and discriminated against to hate their bodies. There is a benefit to the system for you to hate yourself. It serves an agenda. Someone is benefiting from your body hate, and it's not you. It's not you. 
right? And so I want us to think about, like, Sonia Twyman, your bullies, those people, they all got dumped into this same system. And I wake up every day saying, right, like I tell people, you know, one of the things I think we have a hard time doing is understanding, positioning ourselves, not only in the ways in which we have enacted body hatred in our own lives, but the ways in which we've enacted it out in the world on other people, right? It brings up a whole bunch of shame for us, right? Like one of my uh, workshop participants called it meta shame. It's shame for being ashamed, right? <laughs> um, but what I want everybody to know is like, if you grew up in a house that only spoke French, whether you ever tried or took a French class, you would speak French, would you not? We grew up in a house that speaks body terrorism. Whether we try or don't try, we speak body terrorism. We speak it over ourselves and we speak it over other people. Our work is to unlearn it. Our work is to de-indoctrinate ourselves from that language. Right? But it's possible. And so I want to talk about how we can do that. And this is called the act of birthing a new body. <laughs> and it's my favorite slide ever. Everybody should have a pumpkin having a baby. <laughs> Who the baby daddy? You silly. Who the baby daddy? So this is, these 10 tools are really just that. They are ways in which we can start de-indoctrinating ourselves around body terrorism in our own lives, in our own bodies. Because what happens, again, I believe, is that as we shift this part, then it shifts what we do out here, right? But it's got to start in here. So these are practical, easy things you can start doing right now. I love this quote from Audre Lorde. Caring for myself is not self-indulgence. It is self-preservation. And that is an act of political warfare. That the way in which I live in my body and take care of my being is a political act. It's a political act against a system of oppression, against structural systemic oppression. Mm -hmm. So I just want you to know that radical self-love is revolutionary. Right? Radical self-love is revolutionary. Number one, dump the junk. I can't tell you how many times I am flying on a plane sitting next to someone reading overanalyzing magazine. Right? <laughs> Right? With all, like, literally, it's like, lose 30 pounds fast, chop off your leg. Right? It's just, but that is essentially, like, what these, that's what these things tell us. They, right? They, basically, it is, I gave somebody $5 to tell me, I suck, I'm ugly, I'm not good at this, I need to do this different, and look at all these people I wish I could be. And, and I gave them my money to do that. Right? Or I go home, and I turn on my television, to the most toxic television show in the world, which is probably either on VH1 or Bra what is, what channel is Real Housewives hosting these days? Bravo. Right, all of them, right? They're on every channel. Why they got a show on every channel, right? <laughs> but, but essentially what's happening though in this dump the junk concept is we are what we put inside our bodies. We are that, right? And so, if we are putting, you know, this in our bodies, we can't be surprised that we're in a constant state of feeling like crap. You know, it's like essentially like intellectual, it's an intellectual Twinkie diet, right? So like all I ate, what'd you have for breakfast? Twinkies. What'd you have for lunch? Twinkies. Then I had some followed Twinkies, and I chased it with a Twinkie, right? <laughs> and now I feel really ill, right? So... And, and I know this is difficult. A lot of people use those shows and these sorts of things to like decompress, right? It means it's the opportunity to not be in your own life, right? I get it, it's hard. The invitation is to be in your own life. The invitation is to learn how to enjoy being in your own life. And so just try it in small bits first. You don't even have to take it, like I got rid of my television two years, I haven't had a television in two years. Um, and it's, whoo, people tell me things. I'm like, I have no idea. Girl, I don't even know what you're talking about. I have no, sorry, never seen it. Uh, and, <laughs> but, you know, but I have a partner who is like a reality television junkie. And so we oftentimes have sort of battles about it or whatever. But just do it for three days. Give yourself a, a, a one day fast. Once a week, I'm fasting. And I'm only intaking things that positively impact my, 
my mental, physical, and emotional well-being. One day a week. And then add to it. Okay, now I'm going to try two days a week. Now I'm going to try three days a week. It's a quick and simple way to, to, to up the tolerance level of learning how to enjoy being in you and not escaping into things that are ultimately detrimental. They actually do have impact on the way that you feel. Right? The way I describe this as, so disease, right, dis-ease is the act of um, having a host, right? It's the act of illness in the body, right, dis-ease. And what normally happens to illness when it is exposed Right, is that it dies. Right? A disease outside of a host can't live. Right? So if you stop putting dis-ease inside, if you stop willingly being the host of dis-ease, you will find that you leave a state of dis-ease. Right? Just the thing to think about. Curb the fat talk and body bad mouthing. One of the things that I keep meaning to change to this slide Fat talk, actually, is I, I have fat talk every single day. I talk about my fat thighs and my fat booty, but I talk about it from a place of complete affirmation and total okayness with my fat thighs and my fat booty. So my, my use of the term fat is, is a joyous celebration of the adipose tissue that exists on my body, <laughs> right, without the shame and without the judgment. But oftentimes what we hear you know, what I hear when I'm in a store dressing room, what I hear when folks are out with their friends at the table, is a discussion of themselves um, that is about deficit, right? About how not cute you are. And oftentimes what I hear, particularly in um, women's circles, is that people use this language actually as a way to affirm somebody else. But we've been sort of told that we're not allowed to stand in our own beauty. And so the way that you tell your friend that she looks really great in those jeans is to tell her how you're too fat and you can never wear those. But she looks great in them, right? Or I, I could never put, I get this every single day. Oh, I could never pull off that haircut, girl, but you are doing it, right? Pull off. I was like, oh, you, I pulled out some clippers and I shaved, like... <laughs> You didn't have to do nothing extra, right? <laughs> like, it's actually, I assure you, you could probably pull it off. Um, right? But the, but the problem is that the juxtaposition is that somehow you have to be lacking for someone else to be in their power. And I propose to you that you do not have to shrink for someone else to shine. You do not have to shrink for someone else to shine. My favorite quote ever in life is uh, uh, from... Um, Dave Chappelle's movie, Block Party, which came out. Yeah, I love that movie, right? It's got all these awesome rappers and R&B singers, and it's fantastic. And Jill Scott and Erica Badu are both on it, right? And Jill Scott is in the back, getting ready to go on stage, and Erica Badu is on the stage doing her thing, and the reporter's in the back interviewing Jill Scott, and he says, um, uh, you know, so you're up next. Do you, um, do you ever get nervous having to follow Erica Badu? And she looked at him, she's like, have you seen me? And it was, it was my favorite moment in life. It was my favorite moment in life, right? And because what it was is I don't, I don't have to, like, of course I'm giving Erica her grace. She's divine and awesome. But I do not have to act as if I am not divine and awesome to acknowledge that she's divine and awesome. I don't have to position myself as less than for her to be enough, Right? And I actually had a, the opportunity to have a conversation with her about that moment. It was fantastic. Um, we don't have to shrink so that other people can shine. Actually, the world is better when we are all unapologetically shining and standing in our truth and our beauty and our divinity, right? Um, if you had a friend who spoke to you the way that you sometimes speak to yourself, would you, how long would you allow that person to be your friend? It's a great question to ask yourself. Hmm? Reframe your framework. The body is not your, in your body is not your enemy. This is a really challenging one for sometimes. The way that I started off thinking about this is simply like this idea of like when I have a cold, I had a cold last week, and I felt like, I was just gross, and I realized today as I was walking to the airport, I had a little booger, and I was like, people are really giving me my grace today, and then I went in the bathroom, and I was like, oh, y'all are wrong. <laughs> Everybody saw me. That was like, I thought people was like, I see you, sis, but they were like, oh, girl, and then nobody say nothing wrong. Don't do that to people. <laughs> so, but when I thought about this is this idea of like when you're sick, you feel horrible, right? Like you feel awful and you're all, oh, I can't believe I feel this way. 
what is actually happening inside your body is that your body is fighting tooth and nail to restore you to wellness. Like you feel awful because it has taken every single piece of artillery from every part in your body to focus on that thing that has come against it and get rid of it. That's not something that's against you. That's something that is really working very hard on your behalf. And people, and I've had people come up to my workshop and say, well, you know, what about people with autoimmune diseases, like where their bodies are actually attacking them? You know, or what about trans bodies, where they feel like their body is absolutely not in alignment with who they know they are to be? And my response to that is, how does it serve you to be at war with your body? If you are at war with your body, how do you ever have peace? It's just that simple. And so that does not mean that there are not things that, that you and your body are trying to figure out together, but it's offering the perspective of what if you chose to be an ally with your body? How would you go to the situation different? How would you approach those issues differently if your body was your ally and not your enemy? And that's a matter of perspective. That's actually not about what your body's doing. It's about how you choose to look at the situation and which one gets you further in your own journey of radical self-love. Hmm? Meditate on a new mantra. This, is the mir this was the mirror in my bedroom. I just moved three days ago. Um, and it says, I love my body. I live in my greatness and brilliance. And that lived on my wall. It was the first thing I saw every morning I woke up for four years, four years. Um, and when I'm, I had said the day before, it's time for a new mantra. Like, I think, I, I think that one lives in me. I think it's time for a new mantra. And then, I, and then um, the movers broke the mirror. <laughs> I was like, I guess it is really time for a new mantra. <laughs> I guess the mirror is here. But essentially what this is, is that it's an opportunity to, and I, this always says mediate, because I still haven't corrected this slide either, but it's meditate, but mediate, whatever one, they both work. But there's actual physiological um, things working in this, physiological chemistry things that happen when we engage in mantras. And mantra is just the process of saying a thing again and again and again and again and again. And what happens is, Inside of our brains are neurotransmitters. Those neurotransmitters are how we send messages about all the things that happen. The thoughts we have, the elbow I just moved down to my wrist, the, every single thing. So there are trillions of functions that we do every single day. And of course, that's a lie, right? So our brains create shortcuts, really fast shortcuts. Uh, so I don't have to think about the three billion steps that it would take to scratch my head. There's a shortcut, and then I know to scratch my head. We have also done that with body shame, right? There is, I hear Sonia Ball spots, and I have an immediate response, a response that is attached to a memory that is now a function of a neuropathway in my brain. Mantras interrupt neuropathways. They, they redirect your thoughts, and then they create new pathways. So what you do is like, I love my body, I love my body, I love my body for five minutes in silence in the morning. I'm creating a new avenue for my thoughts to go. So rather than waking up and putting on the jeans and saying, oh, I hate myself, like actually what happens is I go to say it, and then my brain goes, wait, 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 it, we don't go that way anymore. And, that, and I find myself actually aware of the fact that I'm about to say that thing that I used to say without ever thinking about it. And then my brain is like, I, no, you don't, Sonia. And then it goes to a different thought because I have actually created a new neural pathway for my thinking. It is an amazing tool to begin to deconstruct old messages that we are stuck in. Five minutes in the beginning of your morning, five minutes at the end, what's... I love my body, I live in my greatness and brilliance. I live in my greatness and brilliance allowed me to launch the body's not an apology. When I went, I, I have a f cohort of homies and we sort of visualize what our plans are, like what our big dreams and goals are every year. And um, I went to say that one and I couldn't say it. I was in such fear. I just, 
who am I to call myself brilliant? Who am I to call myself great? Like I had total terror around it. And my friends sort of helped me push through that block. And then I knew it needed to become a mantra. And now I'm not tripping. I'm absolutely brilliant. <laughs> All right. And in, 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 in a way that, that allows me to be a vessel for whatever it is that's supposed to come through me. Right. Because it doesn't get stuck in the I hate myself voice. Right. Try it. It's great. Number five, banish the binary. This is in my new slide, and it's like my favorite. <laughs> because it's so expansive. When I started thinking about this idea of binaries, right, and particularly thinking about it in the realm of gender, and how completely constricting it is, and how it automatically pushes some people out of the space of radical self-love, right? Like the binary just automatically just says, and some of y'all can't be here, which automatically to me says that it's bullshit. <laughs> and so, but not only is it just about gender, it's about all of the ways in which when we think of the world as this way or that way, we have automatically constrained possibility. We have strangled possibility. When I am either fat or I am skinny. I am either smart or I am dumb. I am either rich or I am poor. I am either this or I am either that. And it erases the spectrum of human existence. The reality that we are all sorts of things at all sorts of times throughout our lives on that spectrum. And that we will be some of those and we'll be others and then some days we'll be all up in the middle. And every time that we are trying to be either or, we are actually diminishing our ability to have our most full, vibrant lives. We are really, really, really keeping ourselves from having the richness that the universe has for us. So if you find yourself in an either or thinking position, go do your mantra. <laughs> Write a mantra about it and, and undo that. Explore your terrain, keep calm and touch yourself. I'm so into just like knowing your body. There's an amazing um, blogger, her name is Jess Baker, her blog is Mil The Militant Baker. Um, and she's fantastic. Her last name is really Baker, and she's super about it, fat activist. And she has a great blog, and she's actually writing a book right now called um, um, 20 Things That No One Will Tell Fat Girls. And it's all about the ways in which, in certain bodies, we're told not to, to touch them, not to know them, right? And so, so, you know, there are people who just have roles and have never touched them, right? Or people who have genitalia that they're ashamed of, so they've never touched it. Or there are people who are so ashamed of their own bodies that they've let other people touch their bodies and they don't even know what's happening with their bodies, right? And so the first way to get in touch with ourselves is to really know our bodies. I taught workshops with grown women who didn't know um, that their urethra and their vaginal canal weren't the same thing. On a regular basis, right? I know 40-year-old women who've never had an orgasm. They got seven kids, right? Like, this not knowing our bodies is a way of being disconnected from this process of radical self-love. Just imagine living in a house and never knowing your address. Every day you'd be trying to figure out how to get back, right? <laughs> like, I don't know where I am. It would be a constant state of disconnection. That's what happens when we don't intimately learn our own bodies. And that is... Yes, um, yes, that is masturbation, because I think masturbation is awesome. But that is also just know your body. That's also just give yourself a breast exam. That is also go, you know, to the doctor and figure out what that thing is that's been bothering you forever that you won't go check out. Go check it out. It's all of those things. Be in movement. One of the things that I love about this is that... Um, Body terrorism has stolen movement from us. It's totally stolen it. It's stolen it and it's sold it to Planet Fitness and it's sold it to whatever other crappy gym that you pay $50 a month to to beat yourself up about never going to. All of those things. It has done that. But who remembers when you were six and your teacher said it was recess and everybody got up and was like, whoa, and flew out the building <laughs> to be in the backyard running around? Raise your hand if you remember that. Yes, right? 
Back when you loved, I used to wake up at 7 o'clock and God bless my neighbors, I know they hated me because I would be knocking on your door at 7.15 asking if so-and-so could come outside and play because I was ready to go do some stuff, right? <laughs> and that is the joy that we used to have about movement. And then it got co-opted and it became you have to do it so that you can look like this or if you're not doing this thing, you're not okay, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It became this thing in which people used it to shame us. And what if we just took it back? What if I took back movement because I feel really good at 1.30 in the morning on a hot, sweaty dance floor getting it? Just cause, right? <laughs> just cause. Because I feel great in my backyard digging out roots and planting new flowers. Just cause. No, there's no agenda on it. Nobody told me I had to. I wanted to move. Right? It really, there is a sense of innate joy in movement when we don't attach it to stigma and agendas and these shoulds that we oftentimes have attached to it. I invite us to reclaim it. It's really awesome. Make a new story. So like I said, so much of our historical stories are attached to old shames, those childhood things that we got but there's an opportunity to create a whole new mythology about that thing that is divorced from whatever it was, the bullies and the teasing and the taunting said it was. My ex-girlfriend is one of my favorite examples of this. So she's Sicilian. She comes from an exceptionally hairy family. She's a ton of big, dark, curly hair. She also has hairy arms, and she had long sideburns, and she had hair that grew on her back. And she had lots and lots of shame about this hair that grew on her back. She just, but she was practicing this sort of work of radical self-love and learning to sort of embrace, embrace those things. And so she decided that she was going to create a new story about her back hair. And so the story was that before she came to this planet, she was an angel, like all little babies came here as angels. Um, and she had big, enormous black wings. But then, of course, in order to be human, she could not come here in her winged form. And so they had to de get rid of her wings they left the imprint of her wings on her back. All of a sudden, that thing that was so shameful for her was absolutely beautiful. It was beautiful every time I saw it. It was beautiful for her. It was a whole new opportunity to tell herself a new thing that was different than what the teasing had told her. Make a new story, it's great. Be in community. Be in community. This is not work that can be done in isolation. It's not work that can be done by yourself at home. I'm just going to figure out how to fix myself and feel better. Right? Like That's actually not what works. That is actually the old paradigm. That's the structure we live under right now. That's status quo, which is like be isolated, suffer alone, don't tell nobody, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, you need to, right? That's, that is this construct. And this one isn't working. We have more than enough evidence to assure us that this one isn't working. What does work is community, right? Which is stepping out and allowing ourselves to be vulnerable. So this goes back to my example of dis-ease before, right? The idea that dis-ease dies outside of the body. It dies once we expose it. Part of that is exposing it in community. Part of that is telling on the voice so that the voice doesn't just echo inside you anymore. When you tell on the voice, you dissipate the sound. And so, it's an opportunity to get out of the, ins the, out the outside voice inside you. Because everybody else is actually thinking the exact same thing and feeling the exact same way you are feeling. You are not, here's, you are exceptional and you are not exceptional. That is the truth. That's, well, oh, my favorite, there's a meme and it says, you are one in seven billion people and you are one in seven billion people. It is both that you are a tiny part of an infinite thing, and you are an absolutely unique part of an infinite thing, and all of those things exist at the same time. And so the more that we allow ourselves to be in community, the more we have the fuel to stay on the journey. Otherwise, we're just trying to run off of our own gas, and then we broke down, and we're on the side of the road, alone, in the rain, upset. It was like last week. Don't ask me why it was that specific. <laughs> there are ways to be in community around it. It's the whole reason that I developed The Body's Not an Apology, because I knew that I couldn't do 
this radical self-love thing by myself. I actually needed you all. I posted it on Facebook because I needed my Facebook friends to stand with me in affirmation. Right. And then number 10, give yourself some grace. I call these body road bumps, <laughs> BRBs. I run an entire organization focused on radical self-love, and some days I can't stand me. And that is the reality. That's the reality of being human, is that we are not static. We are not simply one way. That my, my relationship to myself is as dynamic as my relationship in the world. And that I'm undoing 38 years of body terrorism, which means some days it's really, really loud still. Right? But now I have tools, and I have community, and I got 10 tips, and I got 43,000 people in 46 countries. Like, I have things to help me navigate those days. But I am not um, unaware that those days exist and that they will continue to exist. And that I get to love me. Radical self-love is that I love me even when I don't love me. Is that I love me even when I don't love me. Even when I can't figure out why I would do that, I, ev I love even that. Even that. Okay. All righty, so those are your 10 tools. Uh, <laughs> these 10 tools exist in an ebook. Um, should you desire to take them home, if you go to the Bodies Not Apology store, you can buy the, t the 10 tools ebook. It has a little write up and activities and little framework things to help you put them into action for 99. So. Put it in your life. Uh, this is what I call bonus brilliance. This, uh, Mia Mingus is an activist uh, artist and she's brilliant. Um, and this quote is from a keynote she gave and it says, try on ugly. What would it mean to acknowledge our ugliness for all that is given us? How it has shaped our brilliance and taught us about how we never want to make anyone else feel. What would it take for us to be able to risk being ugly and whatever that means for us? What would happen if we stopped apologizing for our ugly, stopped being ashamed of it? What if we let go of being beautiful, stopped chasing pretty, stopped sucking in and shrinking and spending enormous amounts of money and time on things that don't make us magnificent? I think that's so powerful. And for me, I mean, the reason why this perspective is, is that for me, beauty is not about um, is not about some sort of aesthetic assignment, right? That, that beauty is an inherent state of being. And so when we talk about trying on ugly, all of those things, if, if people are living in all of that, it's impossible for them to not be beautiful. That's the way I perceive that. But I really love the concept of being magnificent, right? Which has a whole different set of assignment to it than beauty does. The curious paradox. The curious paradox is that when I accept myself just as I am, then I can change. Right? The sustainability of change actually requires acceptance where you are. It's the reason why Weight Watchers makes the majority of its money from those people who have been in forever still coming back every year trying to lose the same 10 pounds. Right? Because every year they hate themselves Right? Or they hate that thing about them, and then they go back, and then they lose it, and that was what was making them feel better, and then they gain it back, and then they got to go figure out how to go get their self-esteem back, so they go back, and that endless cycle. Right? It, makes, it makes those companies a lot of money. Right? It continues to have us in a state of constant dissatisfaction with our lives. It's totally possible if you love yourself right now, what would happen with you and your relationship with your body? Yeah. This is my favorite sort of quote in terms of it's summing up how radical self-love changes the world in everyday sort of kind of ways. When you are comfortable with both your strengths and weaknesses, you radiate simple, unaffected humanity. Self-acceptance, total self-acceptance, which is radical self-love, means self-forgiveness. And when you forgive yourself and stop judging yourself, then you won't judge others and there will be less conflict in the world. That is like the tiniest, simplest, easiest way to see how radical self-love is revolutionary. That all of a sudden you begin to act differently in the world because you act differently towards yourself.
totally work. Working in the radical, oh, oh, are they still here? Yeah, no, okay, we'll go back to that. Well, no, actually, we can go ahead and talk about that. So, working in the radical. There are all sorts of opportunities, things the Bodies Not Apology does to help folks do this. Um, this webinar, this workshop that you're listening to right now, I also offer online. So if you know somebody who's like, you should totally hear that, you should send them to our website um, to participate in our 10 Tools for Radical Self-Love webinar. We do them uh, once a month. Uh, and then we have another webinar called How to Raise Your Ruckus, which is a, a three-step, 30-day transformational activity, uh, transformational um, transformation community activity that's all about disengaging ourselves from historical pain, shame, trauma, and fear in our lives. So um, it is the reason I'm bald. <laughs> ruckus is why I'm bald. Ruckus is an enormous tool um, for my healing and my shame. And so we do those workshops as well. We also do coaching and consulting. We're here as a radical self-love resource. That's what we do. Um, and so all of the tools that we offer, we offer, they exist in the world at no cost. Or if you want to do deeper work, they exist at cost. And one of the reasons that that exists, a lot of people are like, why aren't you a nonprofit, Sonia? And the reason why I am not a nonprofit is a couple of reasons. Reason number one is that I think that, it, that we have to stop telling people that the important, powerful work in the world is the stuff that should be segregated off into some corner to fight for some tiny pot of money from foundations, right? That, oh, the things that matter the most, you should just go fight for the tiny scraps that these people will give you. I disagree with that tremendously. In addition to the fact that I think, I believe in this concept called best interest buying. What happens when we spend money on things that actually work to the best interest of ourselves and the world that we live in? What happens when we stop doing detriment buying, right? Buy all the $15,000 we spent because we hate ourselves? What if you spent that money on things that were all about radical self-love? What if you spent that thing on things that actually improve your life and improve the life of others, right? That's how you shift the capitalist paradigm so that it isn't an oppressive structure that strangles us all to death. That actually what we do is we spend our resources on things that lift us up. So anyway, all of those things exist on the website. I invite you to check them out. This is a fond ado, but before we do that, I want you guys to sort of see the resolution of my story. Um, the show that I did was kind of my opportunity to make a new story around my body shame and stuff. So I share the end of it with you all.
I would like to offer to each of you that you have always been beautiful. Thank you so much for letting me be here with you this evening. Um, I've got an email list for The Body's Not an Apology if you want to know more about what we do, about our online magazine, about our resources and workshops and retreats and da 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 da, -da and just, you know, want to be in community, please do that. Uh, please sign the email list. Please go to the uh, website and join the social networking community. Like, it's, you get to do all the things you do on Facebook, post your little status updates and put your pictures up and your videos and all of those things in a community that's really loving. You're invited. Please follow me. Um, I'm on Twitter at Sonia Renee Poet. I'm on Facebook at Sonia Renee Taylor. Um, I do this because I really love being in community. So thank you all so much. You guys have been amazing. And the floor is open for questions. If, if there's anybody, I'm here and I'm chatting, and so it's certainly open for discussion should folks want to chit chat or just eat some food and go home. <laughs> Either way works. Yeah. 